progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we again return to Judges 4, shall we seek the Lord's guidance so that we may more clearly understand the examples, the symbols, and the lessons that he is trying to teach us in this chapter? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this new morning and for these new mercies. We thank you for the lesson that is before us with the symbols that we are yet attempting to understand. Help us now, direct us so that what we do and how we do it may bring glory to your name and bring glory to your character. Help us so that we may come into a clearer understanding of your character so that we may more see and more fully see that which we need in our lives. Direct us to this end. Be with us in this study, we pray. For as you have promised, where two or more are assembled in your name, there you will be also. Guide us now, for this we need, and this we ask. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. As we return to this study, there's one verse that was sticking out to me. And so as we, as we read this, we need, I think, to, to look at the applications because I think there's, there may be more than one. So in Judges 4, 8, and Barak said unto her, if thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And we come back to Judges 4, verse 9. And she said, I will surely go with thee. Notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Do these two verses have more than one application? Well, definitely. I mean, they, they definitely can have more than one application. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to present it this way. Is it possible that Deborah in the early part of the last century could represent Ellen White, that Barack could represent the corporate church, and JL could represent the movement. I don't know if I would have Deborah represent Ellen White. Okay. Why? <clears throat> um, that's too, because if we're using it as a symbol, Deborah would represent a church. And, and it would represent the church in the, the spiritual sense, where Barak could represent the corporate church. Then could it be that Deborah could represent the true believers at that time? And JL could represent the movement. Yeah, well, that's definitely possible. Now, we have Barack wanting to have the, the Deborah to go with him, right? Right. And that, and the thing is, you know, where would you apply that specifically? Like, even if you applied it to Ellen White, I mean, 
the the, the corporate church has still wanted to have its members. It hasn't, it hadn't in the past um, tried to make a distinction between the corporate church and uh, the body of believers. They would just say that the two are, are one. They want to have them to go together. Um, but, but, the, but there are still some problems with that application. I mean, if, if we're going to make an application, so right now we're making the application that we are because of, because of Judges chapter 2, right? Okay, right. Right, so, so we could see that this relates to this movement. And if we're going to try to, to make this application, we, it have to be a different application. That is, we're not taking the, normally what you do is you take an application of a prophecy, like a prophecy is fulfilled and you have this history that's unfolded. And then, and then you take that and you see a repeat of history. What we would have to argue then is that what we're seeing in the movement right now is a repeat of history of what happened in Adventism. And, and, and I'm not saying that that's not possible. I just, don't, I just don't know how I would line that up. And then I would have to say, how do I, how do I make that original application to, to the church at the beginning? Because where, where would I have got that information to do that? You understand what I'm saying? No, I'm, I'm following you. Okay, yeah. Because since we, we're making this application because of some very specific things that apply to our time, I don't know if I would take those things then and lay them over top of other histories in that sense. That is, there, to me, there's something very specific that it's giving us information about to help us right at the moment. That is, this is almost like a spe special application that could only be noticed because of what we're going through right at, just over the last little while. Um, so it, it's like God's just speaking to us through this. Uh, this wouldn't be like a primary application of this. That is, you wouldn't normally take this and and put it into Millerite history that way. No. But the thing is, we can look at this as the symbols of the first, second, and third angels' messages, right? I mean, we, we can see these. this has a line to it that that relates to the messages that we would put on the big line. But I don't know if we could take these details that we're noticing here and put them into Adventism. That That's what I'm saying. I don't see the reason for doing that. I'm not saying that it can't be done. I'm just not sure why we would. Because it doesn't give us more information. It doesn't, it doesn't help us in our understanding of what we're reading. Okay. Does that make sense to you, what I'm saying? <clears throat> well... This, this type of example needed to be presented mm -hmm. because as we begin to figure out our examples, we're going to come to a point where as we present this message, as we present the messages and the symbols that we are learning to others within the movement and others within the Adventist church, questions are going to be raised. We're going to have to be able to defend our understandings <clears throat> and have to be able to look at these situations and these, these different points so that as we are questioned, we can answer clearly. Mm -hmm. Well, I would agree there. The only thing I would say about what we're studying right here at the present time is not something that's going to be presented as a message to Adventists. That is, I see, I just see very specifically that God is speaking to this movement at this time because there's a crisis that's, that this movement is experiencing. And, and so in order for us to, to interpret, uh, Judges chapter 2, the way that we did, because it relates to Colin's prediction, the 2023, January 11th, 2023, that, that span of that prophetic mirror ending there. And, and then 
it's having us at the time we're looking back at our movement and trying to figure out where we're going. And, and, and we have a whole bunch of things that, that, that we had seen. For instance, when we go to Judges 4 verse 3, and we looked at the 20 years. Well, yesterday, we looked at the 20 years, and then I had noted that, the, that if we uh, took these 20 years, and we had, because we were dealing with the symbol of what happened on August 29th, 2019, with Stephen and, and Odilio, and we counted back uh, 20 months, that is prophetic months, we'd come to this date, January 15th, 2018. And if we counted forward from that date, we would come to September 7th, 2019, the difference of nine days. Um, and, and that's going to be when Jeff awakes and points out this apostasy, right? So, okay. so, so that relates to, to that date. And that date of September 7th uh, begins another structure, or it's part of another structure that Jeff noted. It's, it is, begins a, a structure, um, but it also connects to everything that's been happening in this movement. So that, that date was very providential. But it's also on the biblical date, it's the sixth day of the sixth month. And it's in the sixth year of the, the Mayan, the Mayan uh, uh, structure from December 21st, uh, 2012. Um, when we counted, it's, it's, it's in the sixth year of that cycle. So it's the sixth day of the sixth month of the sixth year. And um, so that we have the symbol 666 attached to it. And then the other thing is um, we can take that sixth day of the sixth month, and that can relate to June 6th of this year, which is also Pentecost, the sixth day of the third month. Uh, I, I know that's a lot of information, but the point is that it's, all of this is speaking right now to this, to this crisis that the movement is in. And many people may not even realize that the movement's in a crisis um, because we are in a time of decision. We're still symbolically in this 20th day of the ninth month, right? The call to Jerusalem for repentance for marriage to the strange wives. And, and so my point is, even if there is some other applications of these chapters, because there's history is repeated, here we're looking at a very specific application that speaks right to our moment. And I don't think it's something that we would then present to Adventists later on um, as, um, as evidence of anything. It's just something that's speaking to us right now that we need to heed. Okay. So, so that that's uh, so I'm not saying that we can't make an application. I'm just not. This is such a special case that we're looking at because it's just addressing. It's like a spotlight on where we are right now. And you, you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? In other words, this this is something that has almost a laser focus it has a specific purpose a specific reason mm -hmm. and we need to accept its reason for our time right so I, that's why i try to avoid making an application here to you know what's happening in adventism or what's happening in millerite history or anything because I, I don't think that that's what it's speaking to okay in, in this application that we're making, in the way that we're using this. Um, now, maybe somebody might argue, well, we need it to be a repeat of some history in a very specific way. But all of the symbols here, even though we can tie them to, uh, to other prophecies and so forth, um, the main symbol that's actually here for me, if, if we even go back to that 20 years, so I had noted that the difference between 20 prophetic years and 20 Julian years is 105 days. And, and 105 days is um, 25, 20 hours, as Stephen has pointed out. 
um, but it's also a symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month. And if we go back to July 18th, so July 18th was the 26th day of the fourth month. And, and that symbol there had to, uh, was related to um, Revelation chapter nine, as we know. So that was Josiah Litch's prophecy. But we had originally arrived at July 18th using the 10th day of the fifth month as a symbol. So that 105, right? Okay. And when we had first put them together, they're, they're 13 days apart, which of course 13 days is 18,720 um, minutes. Um, so, so at that time we didn't recognize that. But what we had, what we had initially suggested was that, at least I had suggested it and Jeff kind of picked up on it, is that when Nashville would happen, we had this 13 days in which the, certain of the elders of, of Israel would come and sit before Ezekiel, right? And, and, and so, but that never happened. But I think that we're actually in that period of time that's represented by the 10th day of the fifth month for this movement. Okay. So, so we're in this time when certain of the elders of Israel, and that would be the people in this movement, um, are, are gathering around Ezekiel to ask about the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and, and so to me, this, this is addressing this particular crisis, this 10th day of the fifth month symbol. So we've moved from, in a sense, July 18th to this other symbol. At least that's the way that I understand it. So this story here of Deborah and Barak is really relating to the crisis that is before us right now, which of course relates to July 18th. Okay. So. So if we're making this this application, mm -hmm. combining Ezra 10 with what we're seeing here with Ezekiel. Yeah. How do we merge that <clears throat> with what we're seeing here with Judges 4? OK, so in Judges 4, this is dealing with the crisis that is Parminder. Right. Okay. But I'm saying that I'm saying that we're still dealing with that. You know, my my point is that we have um, we have an error that was brought in. Right. That is one of the nations that we didn't we didn't address. And that nation is still affecting us. Correct. OK, yes. And, and, and I'm saying that we're still under the influence of Parminder in this movement right now. And people don't realize it because many of these people separated from Parminder in the sense that they rejected some of the things that he was saying. But he planted a bunch of seeds that have still been growing in the movement. And these issues have to be addressed. And, and I see them everywhere. Everywhere where I see error, I see error that is the result specifically of Parminder. That is, people don't realize what he was teaching. They, they look at the external things of what he was teaching. They would reject his liberalism and, and, and so forth. But still, how they look at the lines, they're looking at them like Parminder did. And how they're addressing... Um, the symbols and how they're making their applications. It's in this willy nilly way that Parminder did. So, so, so we're still affected by this strange wives, or in this case, the nation around us. Right. So, It's, and that's why we need to identify exactly who all these different players are as far as messages, what they relate to, what they symbolize. 
Okay, but when we, by the time we come down here to Judges 4, yeah, we have now had Othniel, we've had Ahud, we've had Shamgar, mm -hmm. and now we have this, this twofold, we have Deborah and Barak. Right. So, so mm -hmm. we're not, we, we yeah. now have five technically judges, right? Yeah. I mean, it's the fourth judge, but yeah, I know what you're saying. Fourth judge, but five participants. Yeah. So we have, we have the symbol here for the wise and the foolish virgins. Yes, we do. We um, have, okay, but we have also had four types of errors right. that have crept into the movement. Right. So there's four, four enemies that are being addressed. Okay. One of those, one of those four enemies was in the use of sorry <clears throat> one of those four enemies was in the use of commentaries because that's that's what happened when we were dealing with the the book of Joel because yeah. they chose to go the the others that have left from among this fellowship chose to go to the book of Joel and approach a Protestant commentary for their understanding of the insects. Right. Now, and that's putting the word of man over the word of God. Yes. Right. So there's nothing wrong with the use of commentaries. They can give you information. They can connect you to different verses to look at and so forth in comparison. Just like a dictionary. Um, you know, Agreed. It, it can tell you the meaning of a word. But once, once a commentator or a... Um, you know, somebody who's written uh, uh, the thesaurus or whatever starts to make an interpretation, then that doesn't really have authority. They can, they can play, they can direct us to some scriptures to compare words. But if they right. tell us, well, this word in this particular place should be understood in this way, um, and not in some other way, then they're they're not really a lexographer anymore. They're now uh, a commentator and and it's just their opinion they're setting themselves up more as an interpreter yeah so 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 we we know that the method that we follow is comparing scripture with scripture and you know when we look at a word we look at every place that that word is to decide right. really what it means which is what a lex lexographer is supposed to do okay that was one of the errors. Yep. Parminder and Tess were bringing in this, this other type of error where they're saying that we need to be presenting things in parables as if we have the wisdom to do that. Yeah. Well, the parable teaching is, was, to me, it's one of the most abhorrent things that they introduced. Right. And I know people who, who watch these videos who believe that there was truth in Parminder's parable teaching. And, and the problem with Parmin, Parminder's parable teaching is that basically is you can just create the story. And, 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 and this reminds me, of course, of my childhood. So my dad was a parable teacher. He, he, would, he would use parables to illustrate what he was saying. And he believed that since he created a parable, that it must be true. Wow. That, he, that he could have a parable of something. And I would say, well, sure, you're illustrating with a parable, but it doesn't mean it's true just because you create a parable. But he believed that it was because he had the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit had given him this parable to, to understand this. Um, but he also was a dispensationalist in exactly the same way as Parminder and Tess were. That is, um, and that's why when when 
uh, Tess started addressing, you know, that there's not going to be a Sunday law. And um, so this was in 2019, in June of 2019, when they were up here, uh, Tess was up here. And, um, you know, I asked her a question. I said, are you going to abandon literal creation 6,000 years ago? And she said, well, no. But I understood the logical implication because what they were teaching was that in the past, like Ellen White, she lived in the 19th century and, and she just thought like a 19th century Protestant. So she believed all these different things. And, and if you, if you use that approach, you would have to say, well, those things that she believed, if that's true about her, you could go back to the prophets in the New Testament. You could go back to Jesus even. They're just going to be believing like a Jew at that time. Or you could do that with Moses or whatever. You could just say they believed certain things that weren't true, and God just used that belief to illustrate whatever he wanted them to do. So the idea of 6,000 years, there's if you take their their thinking to its logical conclusion, they should believe just like the world when it comes to evolution and the age of the earth. I mean, that's consistent. My dad was at least consistent in that way. He and and but that's the direction that you go. So once you put man's man's ideas above the Bible, there's no point even to have the Bible. Right. And that's, that's you know that that's a major major issue that we're facing today especially within the corporate church yeah but we're we're facing it in this movement and we don't know it right so that that's the thing that that troubles me i, I mean i know you know i've spoken out against conspiracy theories and people don't quite understand why and, and maybe i haven't been able to explain why but conspiracy theories are no different it's putting man's understanding above the bible right and and I don't know how to explain it to people because it's so ingrained in our thinking that we just take what we see around us and we make the Bible bend to it. And that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to look at the Bible, use the Bible as a way to see what's actually happening around us. And, and so people have got it backwards. And, and, but it, it's so ingrained in our thinking that it's going to take a lot for it to be removed. And, and I think that this is what this is addressing here. Um, this story of, of Barack and Deborah of, of how that, that occurs in this movement. So, so we have a lot of symbols still to unpackage here. Yes, we do. Yeah. So, what I was, I guess, what I was getting at is that in the in the enemies that these judges had to face, mm -hmm. we have symbols of different errors that have come within the movement, and we have with the judges the symbols of how we are to battle those errors mm -hmm. we've just identified a couple of these errors now <clears throat> as we go forward with this <clears throat> And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. This is not all of Israel. This is 10,000 men out of two tribes. 
out of Zebulun and Naphtali, one through one of the handmaidens, one son of Leah. And did we decide what 10,000 is a symbol of? We were just barely touching on these. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at this, what can we state as being the importance of the 10,000 being shown here? What, what kind of a symbol do we see? Well, we know 10 is a test, but we also see when we look at 10,000, because we, we did that um, yesterday, um, you know, it, it shows up, well, you know, da Saul is laying, slain his thousands and David is 10,000s. Right. Um, and or it's, it's just used so commonly. Um, and and when I looked at uh, in in Corinthians um, four verse fifteen, for though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. And then in four verses later, yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. So here he's using this 10,000 as, as a symbol of something. Because he's not literally talking about 10,000 instructors, instructors or 10,000 words. But it, it represents something um, that... Uh, um, and, and you got... Oh, what's, what's some other ones? Well, if I look mathematically at this, the simplest thing I see is 10,000 is 10 by 10 by 10 by 10. Okay, yeah. So you get. So does this also have an application back to the fourth test that's being brought upon the children of Israel? as they have been turning to idolatry and not turning to God? Possibly. Um, just other 10,000s and, and thousands. So Psalm 91, 7, a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come to night to thee, referring, of course, to the plagues. Um, Um, in Esther chapter 3, verse 9, um, this is in the context of Haman, right? Okay. Where he's going to pay 10,000 talents of silver, silver to the hands of those that have charge of the business to bring into the king's treasury. So he's got this 10,000 talents of silver that he's going to pay. Um There's, there's just so many, um, there's stuff in, in Chronicles, a bunch of things with 10,000s. Um, Should uh, we? Go ahead. Yeah, and Gideon as well, you have yeah. uh, 32,000 going to uh, 10,000. Right. Yeah. And that was the other one was the Gideon one. So, I mean, so, so you have this 10,000 here that's, that's going to be addressed. And so, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to just leave it there. I mean, at some point we're going to really have to understand why this is being used, why it's 10,000 that are going to go up. Should we then delve directly into examining the 10,000 and see what scripture says in all verses? Well, I mean, okay, how many verses do we got? I get, we guess we have 
46 verses that have 10,000 mentioned. Really? Only 46? Um, yeah. Now that's just the word 10 and 1,000. So if I, if I narrow it down to exact, uh, exact phrases, it's going to be 41 verses. So uh, 41 verses, 48 matches. Um, and and the so while well, we can do this, I mean we can just go through them quickly. Well, what I what I'm thinking, what I'm asking is that since today is our last meeting for this week, yeah. If this were to be prepared for Sunday, okay, and then delve into ten thousand directly on Sunday, then we return to this portion to see what other symbols we can come to agreement on in relation to this verse yeah yeah and, and and it's funny you know which i agree so so we should we should do a study on the ten thousand. but just looking at the first two ones it's leviticus 26 8 and deuteronomy 32 30 that both mention this ten thousand. and in leviticus 26 it says and five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight and then Deuteronomy 32, it says, it, it's asking as a, as a question, how shall how should one chase chase a thousand? So here they're not going to have five chasing a thousand, but how should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up. Um, so it's kind of interesting. They they the one is two put ten thousand, the other one's a hundred. And then the other one's one. So so there's something in these numbers that that we would have to understand on a, on a different level than just, you know, it's just a general thing, 10,000. It, it's related to other symbols. So, so I, yeah, I agree. We should, we should look into this in more detail. Well, I mean, the, the reason I, I make this, this, request or this thought is as we are instructed we are to compare scripture line upon line mm -hmm. we're well aware of that yeah we are not prepared at this moment to be able to do that in this in this one particular passage right yeah and it's actually judges four six and uh four ten I think it or four. There's the ten thousand again. Anyway, it's mentioned twice in Judges four. Okay. So Sunday we will will have that prepared. I'll take care of getting all of the verses put together, and then we can start looking at the meaning of the different verses and how we can approach this symbol. Okay. So now we come and we return to Hebrews 4.11. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his, kent, his tent unto the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kadesh. Heber was of Jethro or Hobab's family, but they had separated themselves from the rest of the Midianites because Jethro was a priest of Midian. Mm -hmm. What symbol can we apply as relevant here with the Midianites? Or with this, this one particular segment of the Midianites through Heber, the Kenite?
So one of the interesting things is he separates himself, right. separates himself from the Kenites. Um, so the Kenites are specifically um, they're connected with the Amalekites. Um, they become connected with the Amalekites, yes. Yeah. And they become connected with them. So Hobab, Moses' father-in-law. So that's the same as Jethro, we're saying, right? It's the same person. That's what I've always come to understand. Yeah. yeah. But why, why the two names? I don't know. Now, in this situation, when we look at it, okay, here's something Ellen White says. So this is from Signs of the Times, uh, August 24th, 1882. Okay. Um, so this is in the context of... Um, uh, dealing with the Amalekites. So this is, uh, let me see here, it's just, uh, so this is dealing with um, the reproof of Samuel to Saul. Okay. Um, when he commanded that a war of extermination be waged against Amalek, he also directed that the Kenites who dwell among them should be spared because they had shown mercy to Israel in their distress. Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses and a prince among the Kenites had joined Israel soon after the latter came out of Egypt. His presence in council at that time was of great value to the Hebrews. Moses afterward urged Hobab, the son of Jethro, to accompany them in their journeys through the wilderness saying, we are journeying into the place of which the Lord said, I will give it you. Come thou with us and we will do thee good. And the Lord had spoken good concerning Israel. So, so Ellen White is saying, and remember, we had looked at this before, in an, uh, um, that that word father-in-law is, it, it doesn't necessarily mean father-in-law. So this would be not a father-in-law in, in the strictest sense because Hobab then is Jethro's son. So he's a brother-in-law. I don't understand. Ellen White saying that Hobab is the son of Jethro. Okay. Not Jethro. So he's not, he's not the father-in-law. He's the brother-in-law. Okay, so the Hebrew word that's translated as uh, father-in-law is um, it can it can mean lots of different things. So it, it just means that he's a re relative through marriage. So Hobab is not Jethro. Okay, according to Ellen White. Okay, so in other words, this would be one of those misapplications of a word? Yeah, it's just, they're translating the word literally, but, but that word has a broader meaning than the English word. Just like when you say somebody's the son of, it could be the grandson, it could be, you know, the great, great, great grandson of somebody. But in this context, this is just the brother-in-law of Moses, not not his father-in-law. Okay. So, okay, I'm, I'm looking at, at several things right now and I'm, I'm having to ask questions. Okay. Here we have 
in Jethro 411, or in Judges 411, we are identifying Hobab. And the name here means cherished. Yeah. But if we go back to Exodus, I think it's Exodus 2, 18. Okay. Um, and when they came to Ru Ru Ruel, their father, he said, how is it that you are come so soon today? That one? Yes. Okay. Ruel is also identified as becoming Moses' father-in-law. Yeah. Ruel, meaning friend of God. Yeah. Now, I'm trying to find, since we have all of these situations, I mean, we have Ruel identified, we have Jethro identified, Hobab, we've now identified as being a misapplication of the word, but still some type of a relation here with Moses. Mm -hmm. But what are we seeing in the names, say, Ruel and Jethro? And Ruel, when we're looking at Exodus 2.16, was a priest of Midian, and he had seven daughters. So how do we approach this? Um, well, I mean, as far as Jethro and Ruel being the same person, but two different names. Is that what you're saying? Right. I mean, well, the so, so one could sort of be a title um, or referring to like some kind of uh, place that he has within the family. Okay. But, but that would just be a guess. We don't have, but we do have, you know, it's quite clear if you're reading in Exodus 2 and 3, uh, you're going to have Ruel in Exodus 2 and Jethro in Exodus 3, and it's the same person. So that one's very clear. But some people, you know, just read um, there in Judges and assume that, Hobab is indeed the same person as Jethro and Ruel, but Ellen White's clear that he's not, that it's the son of Jethro. Okay. Ruel, but, go ahead. So this would be important, like all of these little details, these different names, um, and um, even how we end up clarifying something all become symbols themselves. Right. So this verse becomes another one of these, very much like what we're dealing with the 10,000 in 410, mm -hmm. that we have some details here that we have not yet fully understood. Yeah. So anyway, we have this Heber. He he was a Kenite, but he's going to sever him. So when it says Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites, I'm, I'm assuming that Heber himself is the one who has severed himself from the Kenites. Okay. Right. And he pitches his tent in the plain of Zaanim. So Zaanim. Um, 
which means removings. So he's he's severing himself or removing himself from <coughs> these other people, and he's he's going to be in this plane of removings, which is by Kadesh, which we believe is is then uh, Kadesh Naphtali, right? That's where we decided this was because it's mentioned earlier. And Kadesh just means a holy place. Or Kadesh, however you want to say it. Kodesh. Kadesh. So the Kenites themselves, um, we then understand as being... Um, they were connected with the Amalekites, but they're they're distinguished. They're going to have this. They're not going to be punished when Saul is told to kill the Amalekites. He's not going to. He's not told to. He's told specifically not to to attack the Kenites. Now, because am I sure. am I misunderstanding? the Strong's application of this name? Of, when, I'm of, looking, when I'm looking at this with the Kenites, they are, in Strong's, they are also coupling this with Cain. Um, but they're obviously not related to Cain because I mean it might have a similar name if that's what you're asking is the definition well it's definitely what I'm stating I'm not asking I'm, I'm yeah. looking at now what Strong's is is presenting here yeah so the the words are related um now here, according to uh, Brown Drivers Brig, Kenite means smiths, and and it's the same word as Cain. Okay. We've just been told though that in this, at this time in Israel, there were no smiths. There was no one that would forge to mm -hmm. make a sword or make a spear. Right. So how could, in, in the situation with Brown Drivers Briggs, how could the Kenites, the Canites, be smiths if there were no smiths in that time? But that's just where their name comes from. Doesn't mean they actively were smiths. Okay, because I, I mean, I, I was shocked when I opened that up and they give the initial reference with the name for the Kenites as being related to Genesis 4. Yeah, because it's the same name. But okay. they're obviously not descendants of Cain because they were wiped out in the flood. I, I agree with that. But symbolically, Cain, when he left, he went to the land of Nod. Mm -hmm. We came to an understanding a long time ago that when Cain left, he took one of his sisters as his wife. Mm -hmm. But he and his progeny were by and large separated from the other sons of Seth, the other sons of Adam, yeah, right? So, you have this, the, yeah. so here we have this same name, the Kenites. No, they're not related directly mm -hmm. in the situation with Cain, but the symbol is here is Cain returning with his brothers. Okay. I know that's a strange thought. It just 
I'm, I'm asking, is this, is this going to be something important for us further to consider? Well, I don't know. So Heber separates himself from the Kenites. Right. Because Heber, the definition Strong's gives there is community. And is this movement not supposed to be some kind of a community? Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> what, what Christ is offering is that we can return into communion with our Heavenly Father. And if we're returning into communion with him, are we not part of a community? Mm -hmm. So Heber leaves the communion with the Midianites and he joins himself unto the children of Israel which in the coming chapters we're going to see that the Midianites choose to oppress so the Midianites are choosing then to oppress some of their own such as Heber and his family so now Heber the Kenites, which was of the children of Hobab, the Midianites, of the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites. <clears throat> he was no longer part of their community mm -hmm. and pitched his tent, had his home unto the plain <clears throat> of Zanaim. the plane of removal, as would be shown out of this in Strong's, which is by Kadesh, a sanctum, a sanctuary. Hmm. So why is it important that we have here removals? Yeah, well. Think about that for a second. I got to take care of something. I'll be right back. Okay. Um, any, anybody with any ideas on this? Of what we're seeing, what uh, Dwight and I have been discussing. Maybe the re re removals means the separation from the strange wives again. I don't know. Um, here, so here, just mute, mute him there. Um, Okay, so there's a number of things here that I find this is kind of personal for me. What's 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 being represented here? Um, so first off, when we look at the word tent, uh, the Hebrew number there is one six eight. So what what's the number one six eight? Um, so the word tent is Hebrew 168, which is uh, the word ohel, ohel, means a tent or a home. 
anybody know what 168 is? Well, we had seen it there with the, the midnight cry being on the 16th day of the eighth month, as well as being on the 15th day. Yeah, okay. And also to uh, 168 BC, the Battle of Pydna, yeah. which is on the 1850 chart. Yeah. And also 168 is the number of hours in a week. Right, seven days, Aran notes there. Now, for me personally, because it refers to a tent, um, 168 times 77 is my home address that I grew up in as a kid, 12936. That was the, the house number. Um, and of course, that's 168 times 77. And um, and then we also have where he's going to, he pitches his tent onto the plain of Zanium. Now, I just looked up that word in. Is 65. And my address was 12936 Street. So the word tent which is referring to his home and the name Zanium, uh, give us my address. I don't know if that's significant or not. I represent all, any, all of us individually. Yeah, but the fact that it gives me his, his tent, his home is my address, I find kind of hitting close to home. <laughs> Yeah, I should say so. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's kind of interesting, at least for me personally, whether that's going to matter to anyone else. Um, but, but we could say, at least in a symbolic way, that the message that I've been presenting is the thing that's going to address um this error so so dwight i had noticed that because uh, you had mentioned he pitched his tent or you said the word home right? right correct and that and that hebrew word is number 168 okay and 168 times 77 is my home address interesting 12936 and he's going to place onto the plane of zenonium and that word if i look at the gematria of it is 65 and that was my address when I was a kid, 12936 65 Street. Okay. 65, of course, also relates to the 65 years um, from the, in the prophetic mirror and the 65 days in Collins' um, mirror, right? So, so it has something to do with that. So I was just saying that this hits close to home for me, and, and I didn't mean it as a pun, but that would work well that's a it's a it's a very interesting fun as it is yeah well now, so the question is does heber in some and and then his wife jl is that is there something that's going to be symbolic as far as what these represent in attacking the message of parminder i think there is and we're just we're going to have to dig into this further to identify it yeah now, from the chat, we have 168 equals a week or seven days. Right. So, so when I take 168 and I multiply it by not seven, because it, it, 168 is there's 24 um, hours in a day in the seven-day week, that's 168 hours. Right? Right. So... So, so 168 and 7 are connected, but I, in my address is 168 times 77, my address when I was growing up. Um, so, so this is, has been a symbol that I've noticed in, this, in the structure, is this 168, and also my address. Now, um, but the fact that they're tied here with the 65th, uh, 65 in Zaanayim, and so it's actually my complete home address, 
and even my postal code is uh, Canadians have strange postal codes is tied to this symbols in this message as well. So, so it, it just points to a message specifically coming from a certain place. Right. Right. Um, so that's going to actually be attacking uh, and putting to death Cicero, right? Okay, so, so are, are we making the application then that Cicero is equal to Parmender? Yes, that's that's the application I made because we can agree that um, uh, this uh, what's his name Jabin is a symbol of the papacy, and Cicero is the general. And, and we had addressed already the idea of these 20 years. Right. Um, that these 20 years can symbolize uh, August 29th to September 7th. So that history. And, and, and these all tie together. I mean, it's, it's a really complex sort of structure because we go all the way back because August 29th is when the uh, Pope Pius VI dies in 1799, and so so that's tied uh, tied together, and so you have the uh, 220 years from August 29th, 1799 to August 29th, uh, 2019. But then we also have Jeff on the sixth day of the sixth month on the biblical calendar in the sixth year of the 777 chiasm um he's going to awaken so that's that number 666 is tied there and he's going to point out parminder is being in apostasy and we had on the sixth day of the sixth month um uh, of the first of six days of the general conference we had Ted Wilson reelected, and there's a message regarding Ted Wilson that's being promoted by some in this movement that I believe is still tied to uh, errors that Parminder has brought in. So, really? Yeah. Yeah. So the way that they're understanding and interpreting the lines is because of seeds that Parminder has planted. And and so I take the position that that it's also the sixth day of the third month. So it's also Pentecost. And and Pentecost becomes an important symbol because we know that uh, Jeff is going to be, uh, you know, uh, closing Pentecost when he opens up uh, that prayer in um, 2017 on June 2nd. Um, he's opening the Sabbath that's going to be on Pentecost. So there's these Pentecosts that are tied together and they're also in our lines and they're also pointed to in 2030 as all part of this structure going all the way back to November 9th, 2019. So I know that's a lot of information. So I'm going to have to put this all together for people to see. Uh, but the point that I'm making is that there is an error that's in this movement that we haven't fully identified. That is, people don't realize that they're they're believing in error and teaching in error, and that this error is an inheritance from what Parminder has promoted, which really comes back from the papacy. And and we know the one thing is, uh, it's not just a theological error, but it's an error of behavior on how we deal with those that we see in error. How do we address it? Do we just shut people down? Do we use authority? Do we use a papal spirit? Do we do what Parminder did on August 29th, 2019 with Odilio, uh, uh, John Mark, and Stephen? Right, where they basically just censure them or excommunicate them or whatever you want to call it. Um, and how are we addressing the differences that exist in the movement today? So since there are problems in the movement, the question is, how do we deal with those problems is the biggest issue. Well, 
we're going to, you know, th this is going to be one of those things in, in our conversation. How are we going to deal with problems? Well, well, we know that we have to study and we have to study with the right methods. Correct. And, and I see that incorrect methods are being used. And we, name inherit, one. we inherit, name one, you're saying? Yeah, name one. Well, just how we would take a symbol, let's say we, we look at some numbers or symbols or dates. And instead of looking at all of the symbols and, and all of the information, we just pick and choose the ones that fit our understanding. Right. So the picking and choosing was the thing was the thing that Parminder and Tess were doing. They just picked and choose. Yeah. Jeff, you have a comment? No, I just I just said it seems like a so easy thing to do. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's easy, right? You just pick the things <laughs> yeah, that, that fit into your thinking. Right. And so that that's one of the things. So and we've seen this all through this sort of incomplete kind of study where we look at some information it leads where we think we want it to go and we just we just continue down that path and and don't take the time to look at everything so we did that with the presidents of the united states study is we tried to look at everything that we could that addressed revelation 17 for instance and we didn't pick and choose. We didn't say, well, we like this, but we don't like that. We said it all has to fit because all of it is part of the message. And, and so Parminder, that's one of the things about the parable teaching is it was kind of a picking and choosing. You can take some things from the past and, and you can accept them. Some things Ellen White says you're going to use. Other things Ellen White says you're saying they don't, they don't apply because we're in a different dispensation. Well, how can you decide which things don't apply from a past dispensation and which things do? It, it, it becomes extremely problematic. And, and we also then, have uh, yep. Yeah. Sorry, I don't uh, continue on. I don't think you're well, you go. Oh, you're I'm done. Okay, I was just going to say, mention that the people spirit has been. I sort of see something of that at this year at General Conference. Uh, I just see, I watched a clip there today. Yeah. Of uh, someone who was wanting to ask about the church's statements concerning the, the COVID vaccinations and the mandates. Mm -hmm. And the guy was basically he tried to, there, there was an agenda you could see there that. They had determined to shut anyone down. He was going to ask any question they got there that they just wanted to disregard them, you know, as much as they can. Or, you know, I didn't really give a time for that person to uh, to sort of like see if there's anyone else wants to discuss this or anything that's down. So pretty much, uh, and there was some delegate as well who uh, who normally had been in there previously. I think um, Angela mentioned him, a, a person called Conrad Vine. And he had spoken about the COVID vaccine um, policy of the church, and uh, he had been previously at the, uh, at the invited as a delegate, but this year year they uh, they didn't they refused to, to allow him to go to that meeting. Mm -hmm. It's you know, just sort of shutting him down. So we, we have that people spirit existing mm -hmm. at this year uh, general conference. Yeah, yeah. And, and we also have, now, somebody had said that uh, Ted Wilson was uh, elected with a secret, in a secret meeting. I don't know much about what goes on at the general conference. Does anybody know anything about whether that is correct or not, that it was secret that he was picked or reelected? I haven't paid attention to much of this, so yeah. I, I mean, couldn't give an opinion. Because yeah, somebody has told me that he was, it was done in a secret meeting that he was. Um, well, maybe you should, sorry, maybe you should get in touch with that someone and ask for more details. 
Okay. Also, what was puzzling me, I know we haven't come to it yet, but Judges 4.17, where it says, Sisera fled to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber. And then it says, there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor. You're saying that he was, a, was you know, to be the papacy. He's, he symbolizes the papacy and the house of Heber. But Jael killed him. So then I think, could that represent people who were under this papal influence and have come out of it? Okay. Um, so you're saying that there was people who were under the papal influence that are going to bring a, a death to Sisera. Yeah, they'll bring a death. They'll they'll re repudiate all of these papal influences again, divorcing the strange wives. That's my hope. I mean, I hope it for yeah. myself. I hope it for everybody. I pray for. Yeah. Them. Well, well, we. I mean, not all of us, but I mean, I can say I was definitely under part for quite a while. And 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 September seventh. It wasn't until September 10th, I think, that I finally uh, rejected Parminder's teaching. It took me a few days. Um, well, it took me till September 28th because the Lord directed me up a mountain path because I, I was just in such turmoil, you know, and my foundation was so weak. And I said, yeah. Lord, I might be wicked and adulterous, but please give me a sign. Who should I be? Now, like, whose side? I, whose side should I be on? Who should I be hearing from? Mm -hmm. And he directed me up this path. I went quite a ways up, and there was a rat. He, I, I didn't even see it until after I just suddenly stopped. Not because I was tired, but it's just like an angel made me stop. I saw this thing, and the Lord told me that rattler symbolized all these false doctrines, all this mesmerism, everything telling us hypnosis in the sense the spell and i needed to come out of it and start listening to jeff again you know and i just said thank you lord thank you like i was just praising and singing him it was just wow what a revelation i took that much i had to see that sign and the lord had to speak to me directly about it mm -hmm. wow yeah and um yeah it for me it, it was it was a struggle but um, because I knew exactly where Parminder was going, um, but the question was whether he was correct or not. So I had to evaluate a bunch of uh, different issues in my personal life, um, dealing with my dad and, and so forth that I had to reconcile. So um, yeah, it, it is definitely, uh, to try to understand all of this right now, like we, we got a, a few minutes still. Um, do you have thoughts? We will just put it back to uh, Dwight there. Well, at this point, I think we have a lot we're going to have to address regarding the situation with Heber, regarding this, where he's pitched his tent it's also intriguing, you know, as we look at this with Sisera, that this name comes up later in both Ezra and Nehemiah, because the name becomes that of some of the Nethanim. Hmm. Now, just in these three verses that we have so far centered on for today. We have multiple symbols that we do not yet understand. So we're going to have to take the lessons of the past that we need to bring all of these items together, all of these verses together to be able to truly understand the symbol. We're going to have to understand these verses 
before we move on further in the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. If we are not willing to accept the direction that has been shown and given by that of Father Miller, then are we not setting our own wisdom above that of God? That would be very dangerous. Yes, it would. So before we get into any other speculation, any other conversation about what's yet to occur within this chapter alone, we're going to have to re-examine the 10,000. Mm -hmm. We need to look at the symbol of Heber the Kenite and where he is, is pitching his tent. Once we have those considered and we have come to an understanding where we present this before the group to make sure that all of us are understanding of these symbols, then we can safely go on to the next portion and the next verses. Mm -hmm. Any disagreement with that? Not at all. Okay. Now, we have about five minutes left within this study. Are there other symbols that we are seeing in this, in these three verses? Judges 4, verses 9, 10, and 11, that we need to address when we return to this study on Sunday. Well, one thing is we have this word journey. Okay. Derek, which is a road, and, and it's a very common, common word. Um, it occurs uh, 706 times in the Bible. It's translated as way, ways, toward, journey, manner, conversation, custom, eastward, high, journeyed, passengers, all different kinds of ways that it's translated. But it has the symbol of 1870, which is, is July 18th. Interesting. So just in the context of what we're and she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. And if we think about July 18th, it wasn't for our honor, was it? Mm -mm. Right. It has certainly been a journey. Yeah. So it wasn't for our honor, and yet many people thought it was for our honor. And then it says, for the Lord shall sell, sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. So, so I think, you know, we can definitely see this symbol of July 18th here. You know, if, I mean, we can't just take every time we see the word journey or the 18870, that Hebrew word, and say, well, it's applying to July 18th. But based on the context of what we're studying and how we're making this application, we can definitely take the symbol there and see that it applies. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, any other thoughts or comments at this time? There are, but it would, okay. Uh, when I was looking up JL or Yael, uh, I, I'm really having a problem here. To ascend, uh, useful, benefited, profitable, and all that. Well, what popped into my mind before I looked it up actually was Acts 1 1. And I thought of set forth before I found that one of the meanings for JL is 
uh, bring forth. So I just thought that was interesting. I can't really verbalize it that well, but oh no, that was for made, made as as being bringing forth. You know, anyway, I'm not explaining myself well. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments? Because I I thought that X one one had had said before I looked it up right had said uh, set forth, but it says made. But one of the definitions of made in the Strong's anyway is bring forth. Anyway. Okay. Any other comment? Shall we then close with prayer? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we have much to consider within this portion of this book, within this chapter and with, within these words. Help us, Father, that we may each choose to study this, that we may look upon it as did Father Miller, so that we may see the unity of that which you are trying to present to us for this time. Direct us now, be with us each one, as we are separated one from another. Guide us so that we may come to an understanding and that we may again return to this study on Sunday. Bless us now, may others see your character in all that we do. For this, Father, we thank you and for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Recording stopped.